estamos con... Hace falta decir el nombre. Do you have to say your name? No. No, no. Sean Carmack has no title. Legenda. The legend. Sean, how are you doing? Are you happy to be here with the new technology? Yeah, this is something that I've been pushing on this explicitly for a number of years, and it's great to see NVIDIA finally do it, because somebody could have done this five years ago at least, and it would have been beneficial then, but, you know, it took NVIDIA stepping up and saying, we're going to handle the messy issues in the driver and the hardware, and we're going to beat on the monitor manufacturers and actually get this integrated. So it's, you know, it doesn't change the world, but it's an important advance that I think will become ubiquitous. How can you explain she sing to anyone who has no idea about lag and stuttering? What do you see? What can you see? It's more smooth. How is it? Yeah, it, it is. This is going to be really hard to market to people because you can't show it in a YouTube video without using slow motion or something. But most people almost have a built-in blind spot to this in games because this is just the way games are to people that you get either tear lines or you get this stuttery feel to the game. Now, you know, we made the decision at id with Rage to be 60 frames per second and you play it and it's always smooth. And that's something that we thought was important, but we sacrificed a lot for it to be able to get that that same level of always smoothness on practically every game, even when you're much more aggressive with what you do dynamically and how many, you know, what, how many resources you consume, that's going to be really valuable. For a lot of people, for a game that tries to be smooth, it's like you just automatically got a 25% more powerful GPU because you can now use all of the power. You can now have it get smoother and smoother as you go above 60 frames per second. And for the games that just never cared about it, that just lived with you know stuttering and tearing, they just all of a sudden magically look better like they slaved over those last few milliseconds and really gave a damn through all of it. This is a technology that provides that without requiring their developers to go through those extra tortures there. How is Oculus coming along and is going to use this technology or can it be implemented there? What do you think about it? So to, you, to effectively take advantage of this, uh, the most important thing would be for games that have variable time slices. So this is a little bit of a sticky point, and this is something that they didn't really talk about directly here, but if a game has, say, a 60 frames per second tick rate to it, and that's all it does, then you can't, it's hard to get the full benefit of this because if you miss 60 hertz and you double render two ticks on the next one, you're not really exactly spacing the frames out the way you'd like them to be. It'll still help and they have the option of if they buffer multiple frames, then they could smooth it out, but then you're back to that terrible latency bandwidth trade-off where you can get the smoothness by adding more lag to it. So the ideal game is something that, that says, well, my last frame took 18 milliseconds, this one took 14 milliseconds, and I'm going to you accurately kind of move the simulation there and there's challenges for developers there like most physics simulations are really twitchy about exactly how you timestamp them but at the very least for camera pans for player head movement and for basic player motion it would be good if games start kind of universally allowing really variable rates because it's it feels wonderful once you go even above 60 once you start going to 80 90 get up to 120 turn on the low persistence flash backlight and all of a sudden you're really in a different world NVIDIA fix everything with G-Sync, what's next? 60 frames per second, 120 G-Sync on, 4K, what's next to you? What, what do you think it's next in technology? It is interesting to kind of question what is the limit, like how much do we really care about? And we can look at, uh, I mean, it's a given right now that we'll be seeing 4K tablet displays in a couple years. You know, it's going to happen. And on the one hand, you can kind of say, well, isn't that just stupid? Is, that too, is there a level where it's too much? But, and, and an example, an analogy that I come back to is like laser printers, where when laser printers first came out, everyone was 300 dots per inch. Oh my God, this is awesome. But now you look at it and it's kind of crappy, you know, and you're all 1200 plus DPI. And I expect eventually we'll see displays like that. And there are these hard trade-offs between how much effort you put into each pixel, how much power you burn in the mobile space versus how much resolution, but making all those options available. Maybe it's not the right choice to always render at 4K, but to have that ability to choose that if you want to say, I can balance power, latency, frame rate, resolution, some of these other things, that's great because some things really want it. If you're in a virtual world, you really want extreme high frame rate, very low persistence, and maybe resolution's not quite as important. But if you're looking at you know, a movie pre-production or something, you want your 4K resolution there. You want to be able to squint and pan over every last little bit. So giving us options is good. But I do hope that the 
I, I hope that one of the most important things that comes out of G-Sync is allowing developers to have, game developers, to have a reason to push the frame rates up. Because right now, it's so common to just say, eh, we're a 30 hertz game, why bother pushing anymore? But there's real benefit, especially with G-Sync, to be 40 is better than 30 and 50 is better than 40. I mean, you can start arguing is, you know, is 120 better than 90? And that starts getting into some people really can't tell the difference. But unquestionably, 40 is better than 30. And I thought it was really sad and disappointing that so many even next-gen console games are still targeting 30 frames per second. And that's my next question, actually. What do you think about that promise from the console makers? Do you think we will see 60 frames per second, 1080p, or not really? It is certainly possible. I mean, the, by the the raw stats, so Rage ran at 60 frames per second on current generation hardware at 720p, and we've got much more than 2x the GPU power in the next generation, so clearly you can do that, but if you then say, well, I really, really care about indirect global illumination subsurface scattering on my, you know, on my character's skin, and then all of a sudden, well, you're spending 20 milliseconds rendering all of that, and then you're down to 30. And I know a lot of developers are just saying, well, we're going to be 30, because 60 is hard. I mean, it's, it's, you know, especially when you've got that fixed raster, it's a harsh mistress there to be able to say, you miss it, and it, it hits you. While being at 30, even if every once in a while you miss, the drop from 30 to 20 isn't nearly as bad. But G-Sync fixes a lot of that. It means that, yes, it's always better to be faster. It's always better to be smoother. And, you know, if you find something late in the game that makes it run a little bit better, that's great. Your customers are going to have a better time with it. And the great thing is, it's not crazy technology that requires expensive new stuff. It's a it's a systems integration task that NVIDIA has done a good job of, and I expect it to become widespread, because it's the type of thing that can help almost every application, or almost every game in some way there. It looks great. It's only a, mo a hardware module. It's not possible to be a software, this shit thing. It's not yet. Yeah, it's fundamentally not possible to do in software, because our interface over the DVI or DisplayPort or whatever it is still treating this like a CRT from 50 years ago. It is still pretending at a deep hardware level that we are scanning an electron beam over and lighting up phosphors. And that's not at all what we're doing now. It goes through all of this processing to adjust the gamma curves for the different stuff. And you may have memory on the display board, all this stuff that's, that's very different. But it's an architecture that was born 50 years ago. And it should have changed a while ago, but it's finally starting to move now. And they're, they're in fact doing some interesting tricks, like at the hardware level, the way they do this over DVI versus over DisplayPort, there's some cleverness involved uh, that's required to take that first step. But I think several years from now, people will be like, oh, this is the only obvious way over DisplayPort or any packetized channel that you would talk to a display, because it's just kind of dumb to be treating it any other way. <laughs> John, what's next for you? Oculus or Doom 4, Quake 5, any idea about that? So I, I'm spending all of my time at Oculus right now, and I think that the, the head-mounted displays have there's a lot of what I'm doing now that feels a lot like the early days of 3D, of the first person stuff, where when I, you know, when I wrote Wolfenstein, it was a 2D action game that I had written previously called Catacombs that was basically just turned into 3D perspective. And you look back and it made all the difference in the world. And I think that virtual reality is like that, where all the things that we're already doing a great job at can become magically different in that. And what you see with like the developer kits, the early stuff, it's obviously low resolution, blurry persistence, no positional. It's got all of these things, but you can still sense the magic. And the things that are happening at such a rapid pace, the, the display stuff is absolutely going to get solved. Position tracking has a lot of stuff going, going on for it. It's going to be, I think, really spectacular. And I think, and we've got that... I, within everybody's memory now, we saw what happened with touch, with smartphones and all of that. And I think there are strong analogies for how this should be like that. It's taking one of the fundamental human interaction with the environment ways. You know, you touch things, you glance around at things, and it should have a similarly powerful thing. I mean, watching, you know, putting the head mount display on like my three-year-old and watching him go, you know, run off towards the head for heading for a wall or something. It's something that has that same thing. Like when you see someone interacting with a touch device there, it should be different. It's not going to be everything for everyone at the beginning, but it will be important. And, and I'm, I'm having a blast. I mean, I'm working on the core technology stuff. You know, in many ways, I, I feel more like myself than I have for a long time. You know, I'm, I'm in there spending all of my time on these hard technical problems, writing tons of code, making things happen. And, uh, you know, it feels like it's for a worthy cause. Glad to hear, John. Thanks a lot. Thank you for your time. We'll see you.